Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers, presented by FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. What's new and exciting in your world this weekend? Try real hard not to disappoint me here. Just try. Listeners who also belong to Words and Numbers backstage are familiar with your nemeses, the other James Harrigans. That's right. There are many. The noteworthy other James Harrigan is an economics professor. The notorious other James Harrigan is, well, we're not sure what he does. Likely it's not much, as he's confused about his email address. There's more. His welfare social worker has been in touch with me. There's European other James Harrigan, who is always buying bicycle parts, so God only knows what that's all about. There's other James down in Texas. There's other James up in Canada. Other James in Canada had an email come to him from a woman saying, okay, I need you to pick me up at the airport at this time. (laughs) So there's all kinds of problems. I wrote back and I said, ma'am, I don't know who you are or what you're talking about, but I'm not going to be there. And she wrote back and said, very funny, be there at 830. And I said, will do. (laughs) One of your neighbors in Tucson, Josh Swain, has a similar problem. Whenever he'd sign up for an online account, he found that the username Josh was already taken. Having had enough of sharing his name, Josh put out a challenge on Reddit for all Joshes to meet in a Nebraska field at high noon on April 24th and fight. The winner gets to keep his name. Losers must change theirs. Josh meant this as a joke, but one should never underestimate the power of internet denizens to take jokes too far particularly in the age of COVID where people are looking for anything to break the boredom. Josh's post got shared across multiple platforms and hundreds of Josh's answered the call. An enterprising denizen, Leland Fawcett, not a Josh, took the opportunity to generate free advertising for his presidential run by producing a video documentary of the Josh fight. The video opens with Leland driving up to the field and encountering hundreds of Joshes, some in makeshift armor, some apparently having camped out, all brandishing pool noodles and sporting superfluous name tags. The video is shot in low res because Leland was streaming from his phone and the Josh fight was located in a field in the middle of Nebraska. Now, Nebraska's population density is around 24 people per square mile, but most of those people live in Lincoln and Omaha. If you deduct those cities, the population density drops to around 15 people per square mile. For comparison, that's about the same order of magnitude as the density of matter in interstellar space. (laughs) As you might imagine, no one is going to shell out for high bandwidth cell towers because it would mean pretty much each person getting his own private tower. So Leland is streaming the Josh fight at dial-up bandwidth, making the pixelated Joshes already indistinguishable by name, now also indistinguishable by visage. (laughs) The action begins with the Joshes forming a wide circle around the head Josh, who starts to announce the rules of the fight. At this point, a bunch of Joshes raise their phones and start streaming. You can see Leland's already AOL-quality video stutter to a crawl as Nebraska's communications infrastructure staggers under the load. (laughs) The head Josh isn't using a microphone, and nearby Joshes can be heard commenting that they can't hear what he's saying. No matter, they all know why they're there. The Joshes spontaneously erupt in chants. Josh fight, Josh fight, Josh fight. And the Joshes rush the field. Noodles are flying, Joshes are falling. It was medieval combat meets a mosh pit. After several minutes, the Joshes begin to flag. Fewer pool noodles are raised, sporadic cheering erupts. Onlookers drop their phones. Leland's video springs back to a state of semi-comatose life, and the crowd starts cheering, Long live Josh. The fight was over. Josh won. <laughs> that was the dumbest thing I'm going to hear all day. Isn't that no, I'm going to I'm going to hear some dumb things today, but that's the dumbest. The moral of the story is you need to put out the call for all the James Harrigans to get together and fight. The winner gets your email address. (laughs) I'm not fighting with a pool noodle, that's for sure. (laughs)
All right, I don't even know how to come back from that, but I want to talk at least briefly about the recent move by the Food and Drug Administration to begin the process, whatever that means, of banning menthol cigarettes and flavored cigars, right? So in the tobacco world, here we have a certain class of two different products separated out by the federal government saying, okay, we're going to do away with these two things. Now, anybody who has even a hint of honesty in his heart will hear that and know exactly what's happening here. The FDA has taken two products that black men typically, but black people more generally, enjoy. And those are the first two to be done away with. And if you're scratching your head asking the obvious question, what was this all about? I think you're about at the right place on this one. And I think what we've got here is uh, instead of alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, which I think should have been the group to regulate this kind of thing in the first place, given the tobacco play, what we have here is the FDA taking the lead because of the classification of nicotine as something regulatable by the FDA. And this is going to happen a lot more. Yeah, yeah, we're starting with these two things. And are the majority of cigarette smokers going to be annoyed? by losing menthols. No, because the majority of cigarette smokers don't smoke menthols. Are the majority of cigar smokers going to bemoan the loss of flavored cigars? Well, no, because the majority of cigar smokers don't smoke flavored cigars. You know me, I have a cigar almost every day. I have never in my life had a flavored one. Can't imagine why you'd want to. But here I am crazy like a person who wants his coffee to be coffee flavored, his cigars to be cigar flavored, you know, these sorts of things. I guess I'm just a simple, simple man. I can see people across the country nodding slightly right now, <laughs> about to make a snotty remark. But as we go, these sorts of things are going to start to balloon because we've got a spate of regulation just below the surface that's about to rear its ugly head that will assault tobacco in all of its forms. The first thing that's going to happen is the prices are going to go up and people who like tobacco products right now know that the price is already pretty high. And that's especially true of cigarettes. By the time you get to pipe tobacco, it's far less the case. But yeah, you know, I can give you an idea. Everybody should know that I am an avid pipe smoker. I'll go through a few tins a week. A guy in Canada was telling me that he bought two tins from the United States. And just to be clear about this, that's going to cost eh, really no more than about 20 bucks. That's about what it's going to cost you. If it's more, it's more on a margin. So let's just figure 10 bucks a tin. To get those into Canada, he got pinched at customs and received a bill from the Canadian government, which he has to pay before he can get his package, $77 charge for two tins. Oh, wow. Right. So when I say that government is raising the price of these things precipitously, this is what I'm talking about. There's legislation that's been on the books for some time, but they're going to start enforcing it soon called the deeming legislation. Everything that gets hit with it will have roughly a 100% price increase on every single thing that you want to buy that has these sorts of tobaccos in it. You can bet that this is going to lead to trouble. The way that the FDA separated out a racial group for the first round of punitive taxation, I think is telling. I think we're going to see just how ugly this can be moving forward. And I'm going to monitor this. And I know next week, we're probably going to do an entire episode on things at least adjacent to this. So I would tell people to stay tuned that this is one of those things that, frankly, I'm not going to let go. Just to be clear, the FDA is not banning it. It's imposing a prohibitive tax. No, they're looking to ban men. They're looking to ban. Yeah, apparently they're going to ban certain things. And then they're going to raise the price on other things. And before you know it, we're going to be paying that $77 jack to get things through the door. We're going to be just like England. We're going to be just like Canada, just like Australia. Prices there are so high. I was talking to an Englishman a couple of days ago. And the price on tinned tobacco there is so high, he allows himself one tin every couple of weeks. Wow. Oh, I'll blow through three in a week. No problem. Why? Because it's just not that expensive. And yet people used to be able to say that about cigarettes, and they can say that no longer. The past 20 years of legislative attempts on the part of the states and regulatory attempts at the part of the federal government have yielded out a situation where you may have to pay $10 for a pack of cigarettes. I'm trying to get my head around the mission creep here. So we're talking about banning menthol cigarettes, tobacco, which would fall under alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Instead, it's the FDA, which regulates drugs, 
but they're not regulating the cigarettes on the basis of the drug, i.e. the nicotine. They're regulating it on the basis of the flavor. I can help you out here because acting FDA commissioner, Dr. Janet Woodcock, has the following to say about the matter. With these actions, the FDA will help significantly reduce youth initiation, increase the chances of smoking cessation among current smokers, and address health disparities experienced by communities of color, low-income populations, and LGBTQ plus individuals, all of whom are far more likely to use these tobacco products. I don't even know where to start with this. First, why are gay people being singled out here? I have no idea what that's all about. I've never known gay people to rush to the 7-Eleven to buy menthol cigarettes. That's just ass. But look at how condescending this is, that the FDA oh, is. is basically coming in saying that blacks and LGBTQ people can't make good decisions for themselves. So we're going to make the decisions for them. Oh, I think that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Just astounding. It is astounding. And you can bet that we're going to crawl into this a whole lot more because, Aunt, frankly, I love tobacco more than I love most human beings. And I'm not happy about this. So we're going to keep <laughs> digging it. We're going to keep digging up this hole. But this, of course, Aunt, brings us to the foolishness of the week. You might have thought, and you would have been rational in so thinking, that the tobacco business would have been the foolishness of the week. But no. And you actually might have seen the foolishness of the week in your travels two days ago. I'm talking about something that happened, broadly speaking, on May 1st, May Day, the day all the commies come out the woodwork to dance around the Maypole and do whatever it is commies do. Apart from that, there was this other interesting thing. I found out that May 1st, I had no idea, is known in the United States as Loyalty Day. Loyalty to what? Well... To the United States, mostly. Oh. And a bunch of people in my various feeds on various social media lost their minds and kept saying, see, see, Biden is really a dyed-in-the-wool commie, and he wants us all to take a loyalty oath to the United States. And as a matter of fact, he wrote a relatively lengthy piece, or, you know, somebody wrote it and he signed it, about Loyalty Day 2021. And we'll leave that in the show notes for you so you could read it yourself. The curious thing, though, is if you read it, you're going to come to the conclusion that had Ronald Reagan put this out in 1982, you wouldn't have any trouble believing that. There's nothing about this thing that yields out some kind of high-protein communism deep underneath the surface of Joe Biden. Actually, it's pretty innocuous all the way through. And I'd never heard of this business until people started complaining about how terrifying it was that Joe Biden would write such a thing. So I did what everybody on the internet refuses to do, and I looked it up. Imagine doing such a thing. And what I learned when I looked it up was we've been doing this every single year since 1958. Wow. I had no idea. I'd never heard of the thing. Yeah, me neither. So any thought that Joe Biden was trying to pull one over our eyes kind of disappeared when I had this vision of Ike Eisenhower writing something back in 58. Right. But all those people who thought that this was some kind of aha moment where Joe let his guards slip in and we could make him for being a closet commie, it's exactly the opposite. Why are we putting this out on May 1st? And in 1958, it seemed like a pretty good idea to shut the commies up. Mm -hmm. We took their day and had this instead. May Day be damned. Here, this is the American version. I guess when you look at it, May Day didn't work here at all, and uh, Loyalty Day really didn't make a ripple either. Yep. So I guess it's just a gigantic exercise in abject futility, which is typically what we find when we look at things like this. So if you were all aggravated with Biden, maybe take a deep breath and go ahead and ask some hard questions. Why do you fall for this all the time? Why does it get you every time? Go look it up crying out loud, have an ounce of responsibility before you get angry. If you'd like more details on topics we discuss here on Words and Numbers, go to Amazon and pick up your copy of Cooperation and Coercion, How Busybodies Became Busy Bullies and What That Means for Economics and Politics, Cooperation and Coercion on Amazon. Pretty good book. Nicole Neely joins us this week. Nicole is former president of the Franklin Center for Government and Public Integrity, an investigative journalism nonprofit focused on highlighting abuses of power and cronyism, former senior vice president at Dezen Hall Resources, a public affairs and crisis management firm, and former executive director and senior fellow at the Independent Women's Forum. 
Nicole is currently president of Speech First, an organization dedicated to protecting free speech rights on college campuses. Speech First engages in advocacy, litigation, and education aimed at putting higher education on notice that shutting down unwanted speech will not be tolerated in a free society. Welcome to Words and Numbers. Thanks for having me. You're involved in the topic of free speech on college campuses, which is something that both impacts our lives and it's something we've been wanting to talk about for a long time on Words and Numbers. Tell us some of what you do. I am the president and founder of Speech First. Speech First defends students' rights on campus primarily through litigation. So over the past three years that Speech First has been around, we have sued University of Michigan, University of Texas, which is my husband's alma mater, University of Illinois, which is my alma mater, Iowa State University, University of Central Florida, and most recently, Virginia Tech University. And in case you were wondering, if you sue your alma mater, they will still ask you for money afterwards. (laughs) That seems absolutely right. So looking at those cases broadly, when you take a step back and just consider them as a whole, what are the issues that you're pointing at over and over and over again? What's the stuff of your life? There are a lot of great groups out there that have been working on this, so I'm not trying to steal other people's thunder by any stretch. I think one thing that sets us apart from FIRE or groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom are that what scares me the most, the stuff that we fixate on, is the chilling on campus right now. And usually universities, at this point, I think most of them, even the really not smart college administrators, realize that they can't flagrantly ban speech that they dislike. And instead, what we see now is schools using what I call weasel words to try and ban things on campus. So they'll ban offensive speech, hateful speech, biased speech. And then on its face, that sounds fine. Nobody wants hateful speech around. Where it comes into conflict with the First Amendment is when they try to do that on a public university campus. And students are in this position where they don't know what they can be in trouble for. And through programs like bias response teams, where students are actually actively encouraged to tattletale on each other through portals that are on university websites, students are in the position where they can get in trouble for saying pretty much anything, anytime, anywhere, because schools now have it where offense is in the eye of the beholder. And so even if I don't mean to hurt your feelings, if you have taken a comment I have made amiss, then I can still get called in for it. And so we see these programs being weaponized against students and against teachers, and against administrators. And so out of an abundance of caution, people just self-censor. They just don't talk about anything controversial. It's interesting because the list you started with, it occurred to me when you're about two-thirds of the way through that I was only hearing about state universities. And the First Amendment absolutely applies to the state schools, and then it's not exactly clear or it doesn't apply to the privates. But can you give us some indication of how you operationalize the First Amendment when you go after state schools. We hear different incidents that are reported to us. Students will reach out to us. Reporters will reach out to us. And so we'll look into it. I'll talk to students on campus. I'll ask them, you know, what do you think the environment's like? I look at how FIRE has ranked a lot of schools through their stoplight index. Red schools are schools that have really bad policies. Yellow, green schools that have good ones. But I'll ask students, Would you discuss something controversial on campus? What do you think the environment's like? And I feel like part of the time, I'm kind of a counselor and I'm kind of dealing with kids who have Stockholm Syndrome because I say, well, would you say this on campus? Oh, no, absolutely not. Well, okay, maybe you are chilled. And so it's kind of working through what is that process. Things that are ugly, things that are offensive are still covered by the First Amendment. And I think that's something that, unfortunately, a lot of students don't know, a lot of administrators don't know, because I think a lot of students get to campus when they're 18, 19 years old, and they have never really received a proper civics education. So if the first time you have heard about what the First Amendment is, is this is why Richard Spencer can come to campus, well, yeah, you're going to hate that. And so I think students don't understand the power and the majesty of free speech and open discourse and intellectual diversity. And because they have been coddled their whole lives, if this is the first time you've ever been told no or you're wrong, then yeah, you're going to think that's hateful. And so I think there's just a mindset shift that has to occur as well. At my university, we don't encounter this nearly as much as what I hear elsewhere. 
But as an educator, it's always in the back of my mind because you've got almost this perfect storm of weirdness where on the one hand, as you point out, the terms aren't well defined. So we'll talk about creating a hostile environment. Well, what does that mean? On the other hand, you have this almost quasi-judicial system within the university. They'll have a panel of faculty or students or whatever that sit in judgment. is horribly done. And that's the kind of thing you face to the extent that when I'm putting together a lecture, for example, I'll look carefully. If I have a picture of a student that I have different races represented, so it's not all white males, or I'd be very careful. I use one O-N-E to refer to a gender neutral rather than he or she. And so there's this censoring that's going on that really has nothing to do with hate speech at least from the faculty perspective, we have to be really careful about because of this undefined hostile environment thing. Right. But these aren't quasi-judicial bodies. These are kangaroo courts. Right. Yeah. I think about this, honestly, from a public choice perspective. You have a lot of these little fiefdoms on campus. So there is the Title IX office. There is the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion office. And they have to justify their existence. You have a budget and you have to get through the fiscal year and say, at the end of this year, we had more complaints this year than we had last year. So we need more money. We need to hire more people. We need more staff. We need more programming. And so that's where we start to see the terms being redefined. Microaggressions. This is not anything that was around when I was in college. But now people take offense at things that were not intended as slights. And so When that all starts to expand, well, then, yeah, even with Title IX a couple years ago under the Obama administration, they encouraged schools to violate students' First Amendment rights in the name of trying to prevent sexual harassment. There's been a lot of mudding of the water. And because a lot of people on campus just don't know what they could be in trouble for, they just avoid controversial or questionable terms, events, situations altogether because they're scared. And I think justifiably so. The budget thing is actually scary because if you're at a campus that has very few complaints, if I'm running the Title IX office, one thing I could claim is that, well, people are afraid to come forward with complaints. Right. And so the lack of complaints and a deluge of complaints I could use to increase my budget. Yeah, it's really discouraging. Nobody's going to have the answer here. But what's your suspicion on what the series of answers is going to look like? And how do we start to incrementally beat this back? Because I think you're right to say it has a chilling effect. I've never been on a campus that wasn't in some meaningful way stifled. I'm trying to get bad policies up the books. And so that to me is if a student or faculty administrator credibly fears disciplinary repercussion for constitutionally protected speech, that's unacceptable. We have to get those off the books. Where I think there's a lot of gray area is on private universities. Private universities are able to set their own terms. I got my master's degree from Pepperdine, and Pepperdine makes no bones in all their policies that they place the tenets of their faith above all else. There's a giant 200-foot glowing cross in the campus in case you aren't clear on that, but they lay it out. But there are other private universities like Harvard, like Yale, where in all of their documents, they say, well, we support free speech, free expression, and then their policies don't actually line up with that. And that's, to me, a little bit of a bait and switch. And I think the other part of this then is, even if on a public university campus, we can get the bad policies off the books, there are still a rotten culture. I look at some of these bias response reports when students report on each other, They want punishment. They're calling for blood. They want somebody to be expelled, fired. I mean, they want somebody's life to be ruined. And if I change a policy, I can't change the hearts of men. And so that, to me, is a real big looming problem. And that's something that there's definitely no silver bullet for. I'm going to ask, do you worry about this? And my guess is you don't have to worry about it yet. But at what point do you start worrying that, okay, We've done away with the chilling factor, but if we push too much further, then there are some legitimate protections here. You actually don't want a hostile environment. How do you know what's a reasonable policy versus a not reasonable policy? In the Title IX context, the Supreme Court in 1999 defined a hostile environment as conduct that is so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it would interfere with a student's educational experience. That's a pretty high bar, and it's and, it's not or. Who would think that so much of college regulation would turn on one word? So I think that's one aspect of it, because at the end of the day, we have administrators that are trying to figure out where these lines are drawn. 
this is going to be a little bit trite libertarian, but I don't care what the letter is next to anybody's name. I don't trust anybody to call that line correctly. And so the smaller the footprint, the less that a university has jurisdiction over, the better, because then they can't claim, well, you did this thing on spring break, which, as a side note, a lot of universities do. I mean, the University of Illinois bias response team said, yeah, anything that happens when you're on spring break could fall under us. A lot of universities have anything that happens online. I mean, these are powers that local police forces don't give themselves, that we see university administrators giving themselves. And so if you have a university administration that has finite and defined powers, I think that's one place to start. So if the wording is, look, the reasonable policy is one that prevents the interference with the educational experience, how do you deal with students who have become so sensitized that they'll say that anything, the guy looked at me wrong, and that's interfering with my educational experience? And I think we've seen some schools like at Princeton a couple of years ago, they integrated actually into their incoming freshman curriculum about speech, about free expression, where it's kind of setting the expectations from day one. Maybe this is different than you being at home. You are not here to have a safe space. That's a letter that University of Chicago president had put out a couple of years ago, Robert Zimmer, that you are here to be challenged. You are here to be exposed to new ideas. That is part of the fun of going to college being exposed to people from different backgrounds and having a couple drinks and debating late into the night. It is not a life-altering thing if somebody doesn't agree with you. Maybe you could persuade somebody or maybe you can be persuaded. But for students to be opposed to that whole process is kind of scary. A couple years ago, I remember seeing Jonathan Haidt at a Mont Pelerin meeting, and he foresaw a coming split in academia. He said, someday there's going to be Pursuit of Truth University and Social Justice University. But universities today, you can't be both things, and they're trying to be both. That's something that is a little bit provocative. And to me, all of this is very curious, because we look at young people who come in age 18 or so, and they've generally had the same backgrounds, roughly the same experiences going through high school and what have you. And I can't help but wonder what it was that caused them to think that speech and harm are the same thing. Speech and violence, right. Yeah. As long as somebody believes something, and I'll just be blunt about it, as stupid as that, I don't know that you can do much. When I started this, it was speech as violence. That was the justification for I can punch a kid on campus because he's saying something I don't like. Over the last summer, we saw a lot of protesters switch that slightly to silence is violence. So you couldn't even keep your mouth shut. Wow. You had to actually affirmatively force somebody to parrot the talking points. All of these things are so troubling that there is part of me that thinks, oh my gosh, we're doomed. It is kind of nice because if you talk, you're guilty. If you don't talk, you're guilty. It's 1984 brought home to the college campus. And you're paying sixty or seventy thousand dollars for the privilege, so even better. That's a lot of money to pay for self-loathing. <laughs> Remaining silent is violence, but destroying the person's life by having them expelled or losing their job—that's not right. Well, they deserve it. This all kind of ties in with the cancel culture push of, well, let's just sit on this information, let's wait until somebody is particularly vulnerable and then destroy their life. Because can anybody change their mind anymore? The views that I held when I was 17 before I went to college are very different than the views that I hold now as an adult. But everything I said can and will be used against me. Yeah. If I hadn't changed my mind, I would have thought myself a failure. A thoughtful person thinks. And when you think, you call into question your own beliefs. How does that not happen? I've said this a bunch of times, and maybe you could speak to it with a little more clarity than I can. I see a bunch of young people year in, year out, showing up at college and they're no longer ready to learn, they're ready to teach. They show up thinking they know everything, and I'm the old-time fool that needs to be brought up to speed. And I remember when I was a young person, I went to college to learn, and it would never have occurred to me to tell the professors what they didn't know. I see a lot of universities where I think there has been a mindset shift in how the administrations approach this. You're trying to bring in a lot of students and if you look at your families and your students as customers, then if a student tells their parent, I've had an existential crisis because I was told I'm wrong, <laughs> then the parent comes in like a helicopter, calls the university, says, my child's feelings are hurt. And the university 
seeing a cash cow says, well, we'll create a department of no hurt feelings. There we go. And it's this bureaucracy creep without actually addressing the underlying problem of students need to learn how to be resilient. When you go to college, you're supposed to learn how to adapt and thrive in society. And the students are not learning that either. And it gets a little worse because they used to learn in high school how to behave in college, and then they would learn in college how to behave in the real world. And all of a sudden now what they're learning in college is that you don't have to actually follow any set rules in the real world. You can tank those people just as quickly as you can tank your political science professor. And what I've seen already are parents showing up at places of employment, parents trying to negotiate a salary benefits package on behalf of junior. So not only do we insulate these people through high school, through college, now we're going to do it in the workplace too. Sometimes people ask me, why should I care about what's going on in college campuses? And to me, it's that saying from the Vegas commercials, what happens on campus isn't staying on campus. These students are, they're graduating. They're taking these illiberal ideas out into society, that it is meet and right and justified to shut down somebody who says something that hurts your feelings. That if you have a viewpoint that is outside of what seems to be the on-campus orthodoxy, you keep your mouth shut or you pay the consequences. The kinds of things that students are absorbing over four years is really scary. And I think there are some students that can hold one idea in their mind while just kind of parroting what they need to do to get the good grade. But most students do not have that kind of internal fortitude. And so you just end up paying a huge amount of money to recite talking points and become an automaton. And our students deserve better. And frankly, our country deserves better. Agreed. And I have students that they don't realize what they're saying, but routinely they'll look at an assignment, they have to write a paper, and they'll say, what do you want in the paper? And I'll say, well, a good argument, that'd be great. Yeah, but what do you want? They want to figure out how to agree with me so they don't get in trouble. Yeah. And what the hell is that? That is exactly the opposite, what any person who takes education seriously would want. And I think about this old anecdote from Thomas Sowell when he taught at Stanford a long time ago. And I guess a student came up to him at the end of an economic semester and said, what do you think? I don't know what you believe. And Sowell said, well, that was one of my proudest moments as an educator, (laughs) that he was just able to play devil's advocate and do the Socratic method so well. And I think there's a lot of professors that don't see it that way anymore, where they see it is their job to send students on a journey towards a particular ideology. And so I think the fault lies at many people's feet, although I do like to throw stones at college administrators. And honestly, I hear the professors you're talking about, they use the language of warfare when they talk about their role. We're fighting the good fight. We have to get the enemy. These sorts of crackpot statements. And they have won. The climate on college campuses is now composed entirely by them and their friends. And a number of people on the other side of the equation look around and think, wow, that's fundamentally unjust, but they don't say that out loud all that much. I have never worked at a university, but I'm glad that there are groups like Heterodox Academy and Robbie George's new Academic Freedom Alliance, because it is in everyone's best interest for there to be diverse perspectives on campus. If you have to produce peer-reviewed research, if you have to put journal articles out there Wouldn't you want one of your colleagues in your department who you know pretty well coming into your office and saying, hey, man, I think you might want to beef up this section. I have some concerns about this. Rather than having some wacko on the Internet throw stones at you, universities are there for the pursuit of truth, not to be echo chambers. And that's something that I think a lot of people have lost sight of. Do you see any trend yet? I'm thankful for the fact that I've noticed over the decades, that there's a generational effect in colleges. It seems to go very quickly, like every four years, maybe every eight years, where the students coming in are markedly different from the ones who just left. Do you see this whole situation improving or degrading over the next few years? When we started Speech First in 2018, it was right after there was a whole big slate of cancellations. And every year, I guess around this time is when students start to protest about, oh, I don't like this person as our graduation speaker. And then universities, for the next two or three years, they invited a bunch of milk toast, wonder bread, super boring celebrities who wouldn't say anything controversial. Instead of bringing in interesting people like Christine Lagarde from the IMF, who was somebody that people protested, or Condoleezza Rice. Instead of having luminaries that might say something a little bit provocative, it was just a bunch of boring celebrities. 
And then we saw a counter reaction of trustees that got pissed off, alumni who got pissed off about this, and universities kind of starting to develop a little bit of a backbone. I think right now there are 81 schools that have adopted the Chicago Statement, trying to frankly differentiate themselves in the marketplace. And so, yeah, I think the pendulum is swinging back and forth. Where it will end up, I'm not sure. I thought we had the bias response team thing pretty beat back. And then after all the George Floyd protests last summer, a lot of schools have started to adopt and come back with a vengeance. And now schools are also using those reporting portals to encourage students to report on each other for not wearing COVID masks. So there is this policing impulse of universities and this tattletale impulse of students. And so that's something that I don't think is going away. The most interesting thing, though, for my money, and maybe I conflate interesting and optimistic, it's that University of Chicago statement, which was, I thought, absolutely beautiful. As I read it, I thought, if I were tasked with writing this, it would have been mostly what I'm holding in my hands right now. And you say, and I think rightly so, that a number of schools are clearly adopting it to say, not us, look at us. And I think that's generally fine, signaling something to the market. But where do you think that statement is, say, five years from now, 10 years from now? Does that come to rule the day, or is that just a silly footnote down the road? I don't think it's a footnote. I think the messaging is good. I think the University of Chicago leadership has turned over. And so we'll see how committed administrators remain to this. But it's been interesting for me to see who has been pushing for that statement to be adopted on different campuses. In some places, it's been students like a student government will pass it and then they'll take it to the administration and the administration won't, well, that's a really bad look. On some campuses, it's been faculty and then the administration is put in an interesting position. And so I would love to see all these different factions start to work together because at Williams College, when they tried to pass that statement, it was the faculty, it was the professors who said, we don't want this, this is hateful. And so to watch how that has been spun out of proportion, I think is crazy too, because at the end of the day, It's a voluntary statement. These are our principles. This is what we believe in. It's not going to fire you if you don't agree with it. I'm old enough to remember when, regardless of your political persuasion, you thought free speech was a very good thing. And people routinely, when I went to college, defended their ideological enemies on free speech grounds. That No, they have to be allowed to say these things. I went to the University of Connecticut. When I was there, they passed an internal rule against this thing they called laughism. That was that any time you said something that caused anyone to laugh at somebody else, you were guilty. And it was long before hate speech was a thing. And the professors I had ridiculed it nonstop. They couldn't (laughs) stop ridiculing it. And I thought that was a pretty healthy thing, that the administration said this stupid, stupid thing. And all the professors said, yep, no, I don't think so. And where are those guys now? Because the left and the right and the weirdos on the outskirts of human thought, they all agreed that that was crazy. And I just don't see that kind of agreement on a fundamental issue anymore. Humor, satire, and parody are hugely effective ways to speak truth to power. And now we're told that if you make fun of somebody, if you make a joke, that it's your punching down. And that's why we see comedians who refuse to do shows on college campuses anymore. And so you end up with a bunch of humorless Victorian (laughs) scold clutching their pearls. At the end of the day, it's also, I'm taking offense on behalf of somebody else. I'm showing how magnanimous I am such a broad thinker that I can anticipate that Ant and James will be offended by this thing. And so I'm not going to allow to say it because I'm going to protect you. And I used to run a women's organization. And how dare you? I can make up my own mind for myself. I'm well able to stand up for myself and to know what pisses me off. I don't need you to do that for me. I've always kind of wanted to print out a bunch of coupons that just say 25% off your fainting couch. You just take this coupon and go get your fainting couch and leave me alone. Your story reminds me, many years ago, the first institution I taught at out of graduate school, I was at a faculty meeting and the faculty member sits in a wheelchair and she says something to the dean referring to disabled people and the dean corrects her. She's sitting in a wheelchair and says, oh, no, you mean differently abled. (laughs) I was astounding. Come on. Where's the shame? Yeah. (laughs) We're talking about hostile environments, this sort of thing. But then how do you deal with situation, and my alma mater has this right now, of you're teaching English and you're teaching Mark Twain. 
and he uses the N-word. And the solution here was you either take the word out or you get rid of the reading entirely. Right. I think just within the past month or so, a teacher got in trouble for saying the phrase N-word. Didn't actually say the word itself. Wow. Even the phrase itself. But he got in trouble for it. the yeah. phrase, not the actual word. And so... But what the hell are we supposed to call it now? <laughs> no, I think, Aunt, you're right. People are just refraining from books altogether. Yeah. But the kinds of things that are being taken out of literature, we're canceling books altogether. If we continue down this path in 30 or 40 years, there is not going to be a common body of where everybody refers to the Bible, everybody refers to this, and people kind of get the same analogies. We have all become so siloed that we're not going to be able to relate to each other. Hmm. It's the danger of a boutique culture. We're all just surrounded by things and people that we really, really like, never challenged by anything. How did you end up getting into this line of work? You've set yourself up for real heartache. <laughs> Did you say to yourself, what can I do that will cause me all kinds of grief and aggravation for the next 50 years of my life? It's actually funny. When I started it, I used to joke with my husband who did the Heller gun case, as you guys know. I said, well, how hard can this be? People like my amendment. Nobody likes your amendment. And after about six months, I was like, nobody likes my amendment either. Okay. <laughs> really, I was so starry on going into it. I was like, okay, well, we'll get to the Supreme Court in two or three years, and then I'll go work on the Third Amendment. I'll go do something else. Nobody does the Third Amendment anymore. My brother was in the Army, and I lived with him, and he was a bad roommate, so I'm opposed to quartering your soldiers. But I kind of fell into it. I used to run a state-level investigative journalism organization, and as the president slash fundraiser, you look at the traffic, and people were always really interested in the higher ed stories. And there was part of me that thought, well, is this just like a little bit of right-wing hysteria, quite frankly? Is there really a there there? And then in talking to the porters, I found that it's worse in many places than anybody has any idea. And universities are not great actors in this. They try to hide behind things like FERPA, the Federal Privacy Act, because there's a lot of stuff that they're doing that they're really embarrassed about. And so there's problems with transparency trying to get this information out there. And then aside from the bad policies, there's just this rotten culture. So there's problems up and down. Nikki, well, that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Thank you so much for coming. And why don't you tell our listeners how they can find you, your organization, what you would like them to know about you online somewhere? Sure. Our website is speechfirst.org, and we're on all the usual social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And yeah, we're structured as a membership association. So when we sue schools, it's speech first versus a school instead of being Nikki versus the University of Illinois. That way we're able to protect students' anonymity as well as sidestep a problem called standing, where if an individual were to sue their school, universities have actually figured out that all they need to do is to wait a student out. And if you graduate, if you transfer, then the harm has gone away, the case is thrown out. As an association, as long as we have a member on campus, our lawsuits can go on forever. So yeah, that's our thing. And as usual, we will put links in the show notes for you to make all of this as easy as we can. Nikki, thanks for coming. Thanks, Nikki.